Good afternoon. I am Kevin Sheth, the Vice Chair for Clinical and Translational Research, a stroke and critical care neurologist here at Yale University. I'd like to begin by thanking the conference organizers for the invitation to speak today. The topic is the long-term plan for stroke in the Arab world. Here are my disclosures. Uh, we've been privileged in our group to receive significant support from the National Institutes of Health in the United States, the American Heart Association through several awards, and uh, several academic industry uh, collaborations. The topic that I was assigned was regarding long-term uh, future stroke care in the Arab world. But I need to begin by sharing a few caveats. First of all, when it comes to stroke care, I'm not sure that I understand the present fully, and therefore, I'm not sure that I can predict the future. In the United States, for example, the last two decades, the same time period, have really invigorated a new era for stroke. Stroke collaboration, stroke systems of care, and stroke treatment. We've made significant advances in stroke prevention, in stroke treatment, and stroke-related mortality. I specifically highlight prevention and acute treatment because stroke rehabilitation and recovery is something that we still have to make significant progress on when it comes to innovation, scientific discovery and implementation. However, despite the progress that we have made, we continue to have significant disparities in stroke and portions of our population have not realized this benefit for decades. So the advantage of making innovations and improving stroke care is that we have robust models where we can show that we can improve patient lives and patient outcomes. Oftentimes that creates disparities for a number of different reasons and that in itself is a new era of inquiry, of investigation, an opportunity for stroke improvement. This is a paper uh, that was published by the Global Disease, uh, Global Burden of Disease Collaboration. This is a group that has been funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and that examines the prevalence and incidence of communicable and non-communicable diseases around the world. This group also evaluates the disability and mortality that results from various disorders in various parts of the world. In 2019, published in Lancet Neurology, the Global Burden of Disease examined the incidence, prevalence, and the disability that results from stroke around the world. This is a little bit of a complicated figure taken from that Lancet Neurology paper. So I'll walk you through it. What you'll see here is a number of different uh, squares and diamonds of different colors. These signify different uh, groups and different geographies from around the world. What you'll also see across the X axis is the SDI. The SDI is a type of social determination index that incorporates features uh, of the population, such including education attained, uh, fertility rates, and other measures that provide broad uh, demographic and population level assessment to compare populations. What you see on the Y axis is the age adjusted uh, disability life year rate per 100,000 people. And again, this is for stroke. For example, what you can see is that this, the bottom right-hand corner, is where you would like to be as a population in an ideal state. Uh, this represents in part a society that 
has access to robust economic resources and has broad, robust public health parameters. It also has uh, a low disability rate uh, that's age adjusted. And as you can see here, uh, this tends to predominate in the high income uh, Western countries. Now, if you notice and you look at the green diamond and uh, then you can, uh, sorry, the green square, there you can start to see uh, North Africa and the Middle East. And these areas, uh, both the green diamonds and the green squares, they represent uh, areas that when it comes to stroke disability and adjusted for their uh, age adjusted measures of disability, as well as their SDI, they're uh, better than certain parts of the world, yet there are clearly improvements that can be made when it comes to disability rates. There have been a number of reports over the course of the last decade that uh, attempt to quantify the uh, uh, incidence and prevalence of stroke per 100,000 people. This is a paper from the Journal of the Neurological Sciences in approximately 2010 that shows, depending on what part of the Arab world you're looking at, that uh, the rate of stroke is somewhere between 90 and 120 uh, per 100,000 people. And this seems to be roughly the range uh, that one might expect uh, when you look at various papers uh, published from this era. In some ways, this is a relative uh, decrease compared to 20 or 30 years ago. And around the world, what we see is this kind of relative decrease that has happened in almost any area, except perhaps uh, aspects of East Asia. However, uh, along with this improvement with stroke burden and stroke mortality, we do see that around the world, the rates of improvement do vary significantly. And in recent years, in some areas, the rates of those improvements have started to level off. There is a lot of speculation and study regarding the primary determinants of these uh, rates of change. Uh, two factors that are commonly cited are number one, the aging population in many parts of the world, as well as uh, the modern so-called Western diet that now seems to have uh, permeated throughout much of the world with regard to uh, higher rates of obesity, diabetes, uh, diabetes, uh, high calorie and high fat diets. Uh, these two factors really uh, persist with regard to potentially threatening the gains that have been made over the previous decades. These trends mean, and I think this is particularly true for the Arab world, that the immediate future, the next five to 10 years at least, will require stroke ascertainment and quality improvement strategies to effectively implement what we have established through science. The focus in this context will most likely be on prevention and acute treatment and focusing on both the patient level and the population level approaches. One of the things that I'd like to do as an example of a quality improvement initiative is to highlight something that was done in the US only 10 years ago. Uh, this was an example of a collaborative uh, project that was done with the American Heart Association, Get With The Guidelines program, uh, for what we had known as a broad stroke community that uh, uh, TPA was effective for acute ischemic stroke and that time to TPA or reperfusion was a critical determinant of patient level outcome. 
So many leaders in the U.S. stroke community uh, began a program to improve the door to needle time in ischemic stroke. The basis for this, first of all, was recognizing that there was significant practice variation and uh, uh, variation in door to needle times in uh, centers throughout the United States. And this really highlights one of the most important principles in the quality of care and quality of care improvement which is that it is important to create platforms, local, regional, and national platforms that allow you to measure uh, stroke uh, quality improvement measures. If you don't measure it, you can't improve it. So in Project Stroke, this was indeed a national quality improvement campaign of the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association that was designed to improve uh, as the process for ischemic stroke patients by helping hospitals achieve door to needle times of 60 minutes or less. By participating in this endeavor in, in target stroke, hospital teams could work towards eliminating delays and treating stroke patients with the ultimate goal of improving clinical outcomes. Well, how would you do this across tens or hundreds of thousands of patients and across dozens, if not hundreds of hospitals? Well, ultimately it required education campaigns and customizable implementation tools that could be developed on a national level, but then successfully deployed and personalized at a hospital level. These are some examples of customizable implementation tools, which included patient time trackers, guideline-based, scientifically-based algorithms, TPA checklists, standardized order sets, clinical pathways, evidence-based protocols, patient education materials, and other tools. Tools that would be simple, effective, based in science, and that sites could use in a reasonable, feasible way. The other important uh, uh, part of the program was something that is embedded in the title, uh, was that it was important to create uh, quantifiable uh, targets that could be measured. And those targets were broken down into discrete components, including the time from uh, door to physician, uh, uh, door to ED physician, door to stroke team, uh, door to CT scan, CT scan and neurology consult. So what you can see here is that there was root cause analysis done to really focus in on the essential and critical components that were required for TPA administration. And in doing so, removing all of those components that were not critical for that assessment. You don't see placement of Foley catheter. You don't see placement of EKG leads, things like this that wouldn't uh, be primarily directed towards administering TPA. The other part of the program prior to and during implementation was a platform to educate and disseminate best practice strategies. There were many that were developed. These are just some examples of best practice strategies uh, that uh, you know, manifest, for example, through uh, the pre-hospital and acute notification to the emergency providers. There was advanced hospital notification by emergency medical services so that EMS providers in the field could recognize stroke and communicate to teams that were in the emergency department to implement and create a rapid triage protocol and stroke team notification that acknowledged the multidisciplinary care involved in acute stroke pathways that incorporated pre-hospital personnel, ED providers, nurses, pharmacists when appropriate, and also neurologists. And innovative uh, measures at the time 
such as the single call activation system, where a single call would not activate all of the members of the stroke team. And so that you could facilitate parallel processing in real time rather than serial processing of workflow where in a situation where we know that time is brain. I'm happy to see that this isn't just the past, but it's already the present and the future that new certifications in the Middle East uh, and in the Arab world are already partnering uh, to improve stroke care. Just uh, one year ago, the UAB and the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, developed a single comprehensive set of stroke certification services through a new collaboration with the Middle East and the North Africa Stroke Organization and the American Stroke Association. So we're glad to see that this is indeed happening. What are some lessons that we learned during this time? Well, that stroke is largely the result of shared risk factors in cardiometabolic disorders. Number two, that an interdisciplinary partnership is required with nursing, primary care, cardiologists, endocrinologists, nephrologists, and others. This is critical. Stroke education is critical. And the audiences include the broader public, your medical colleagues, and public health entities. We're talking about the future. Some of these things may seem like elements of the past, but when it comes to stroke care, doing this at scale is uh, something that we really uh, uh, have not done uh, to the full extent in many parts of the world, including many parts of the United States. The other thing that I would say transitioning to the future is that there can be all kinds of uh, novel approaches that are taken as well. So learning and adopting best practice strategies for things like quality of care improvements are lessons that we can share with each other from around the world. But it's important to recognize that sometimes in different societies because of different uh, structures, there is the opportunity for unique uh, approaches. For example, just recently, uh, this was a case report uh, of a group in Canada that performed the first in human robotic assisted neuroendovascular intervention uh, using a telerobotic system, potentially creating a pathway for an interventionalist to be sitting at a console performing an endovascular stroke procedure uh, where a robot may be available in a hospital uh, many miles away. Well, this is something that may be very difficult to scale, for example, in the US system based on uh, the cost for the technology and our current reimbursement system. But you can imagine that in other systems where the cost to entry may be satisfied, uh, there may be, uh, and the healthcare reimbursement system may be different, perhaps an approach could be something that could be used in, a, uh, in order to uh, make available more uh, uh, widespread availability of endovascular treatment. Sometimes uh, creative innovative treatments to stroke care uh, don't require uh, fancy uh, 22nd century uh, technological innovations. This is a very exciting story that has been developing over the course of the last decades. And published in Nature Medicine just uh, one or two years ago. In Peru, there was, uh, uh, based on some uh, very exciting uh, basic science that had developed over decades, an idea that at the population level, you can replace uh, sodium chloride as a salt substitute with potassium chloride. And indeed, uh, this was done and done in six villages uh, in uh, an area in Peru. And in over 2000 patients, what uh, uh, investigators were able to demonstrate 
that the replacement of sodium chloride with potassium chloride showed an average reduction of 1.3 millimeters of mercury uh, in the systolic blood pressure. Uh, urinary sodium levels were also measured. And while there was a change in the replacement of sodium for potassium, uh, this did not correspond to any unsafe levels of serum or plasma levels of potassium. One millimeter of mercury of blood pressure may not sound like much, but at a population level, uh, it really has a very large impact for a low cost solution that can be scaled and could have significant effects for cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, but really also for stroke related morbidity and mortality. Just recently, this salt substitution approach was also deployed in an even larger scale in uh, China at uh, the population level, uh, resulting in benefits, not just for cardiovascular events, but in particular for stroke and death. So perhaps innovative public health measures like this will be more successfully applied in certain governments uh, rather than others, again, because of the various pressures that may be variable from location to location. Finally, the last thing that I would say, and I'm very excited about, is that the future of stroke care in the Arab world really in inevitably, whether it's through innovation, through quality of care, and through science, really is investigation through collaboration. In the United States, we developed a robust network known as the NIH StrokeNet Network, which now performs a series of uh, phase one to three trials in stroke prevention, acute treatment, and recovery. And more recently, has partnered with an international network of networks around the world known as GAINS, the GAINS Stroke Network. I'm really excited and optimistic because I am hopeful that the Arab world will create and also join these kinds of efforts in the future. So in conclusion, I wanna highlight that quality programs are important. We can only improve what we measure. That prevention and acute treatment are likely in uh, areas uh, that uh, in the uh, years ahead. And it is critical to collaborate across every possible dimension, resulting in improvements not only for stroke, but ultimately I think you will see for brain health and the preservation of ability I am confident that the region will learn from others, but also that you will innovate through investigation in a way that inspires others. Thank you again uh, for the invitation, and I look forward to working with many of you in the years to come.